So welcome to the session. So what did you say is we're going to just be more of a kind of discussion points and kind of talking through some different things to think through as you're getting your, your research lab running for the semester. Um, and it's some of it's like more geared towards like how to get like maybe new uh, new students or RAs uh, trained up and so that way you can really get started ASAP. Um, some of these things might work for some disciplines, and, uh, disciplines, others might work for other disciplines. So it really depends. So I, I do want to have that caveat that it really depends on what you're doing, how your lab structure is set up. I'm going to talk through that as well. Um, but we also want to make this also more of a discussion. So we can talk through like if there's specific things that would be more of help to talk through. If you have questions, we're going to keep this really flexible and loose. Um, so we'll go from there. So did you want to keep going or? Um, well, we can, let's also kind of put a quick plug in for the, do you want to mention about the other session as well? Oh yeah. So we do have <clears throat> another session next Wednesday, um, research data and methodology support and resources from CTRL and the library. That's next Wednesday on the 23rd from 2 to 3.15. And that's with Eric and I and Jesse Breen and um, Stefan Kramer. So if you're also interested in some of those resources available, um, please come and attend that, register for that particular session as well. That's next Wednesday um, from 2 to 3.15. And that's going to be a little bit more broad. That's not just CTL resources, but it's also library resources too. So they'll be, they have um, there's some additional things that we don't support or handle. So it's that way you get some more options there too. Um, but yeah, let's let's kind of let's I guess we're gonna start with um, let's go down some of the learning outcomes that we have, and then we kind of kind of talk through some recommendations and things that we've seen that have worked, and then but this kind of specifics that you all want to talk about too. Please please raise your hand, unmute. And we'll just have you more of a discussion rather than just kind of us talking because we can talk for a while, but I really want to make sure there's, a, if there's specific things that would be really helpful for you to kind of either talk through or get some different thoughts on what work has worked, what hasn't worked. I want to make sure that we spotlight that. So, um, go ahead. Oh, um, so I guess let's go ahead and um, one thing I want to mention too is think through how you're going to organize stuff within your lab. That's the biggest thing. I'm I'm obsessed with organization and efficiency. Um, so I'd like to use like Google Drive or Teams. Um, so it's you can use OneDrive for this as well. I just like the flexibility of Google Drive because it makes it easier for folks. Like um, if it's a new grad student and they don't have all their like the email stuff set up, it's a quick pass through like a Google Drive because almost everyone has Google Drive or Google accounts. So you can add them to a Google Drive that has like all. Here, let me go ahead and show my share my screen. Um, so I I don't. I do research, but I don't have like a research lab at AU or anything like that. So is that showing, this is Trello. I'll talk about Trello in a few minutes. So I, I have some collaborators at other universities. So I do Bayesian psychometric work, uh, but we have, we organize into like different folders. So if you have like a folder of, these are some, some key articles that the research lab does or that your lab does. And this could be previous articles or if there's seminal articles, that you have, I would post them in there. And you can also have like a folder for like um, IRB documentation. So like city trainings, if you're doing human subjects research, you can have all that in the location where it's accessible. And so if you're trying to do quick things with like an IRB submission, well, you have all of that there for your lab. Um, you can also have like a, a lab reading list. So I like to think of it as like a, um, when you first get started, in any sort of documentation, it's like read me first text file. So actually I have one at the bottom here, read me. And that it kind of gives an overview of what's in that folder. And like, if there's a chronological sequence for reading stuff, that's giving any new folks for your lab an idea of, well, where should they start? Um, 
And they can also be some lab specific, like training documents, like dress code, uh, norms that you have. So if you're actually doing, I used to do experimental research in, in grad school. So we used to have like our protocols on there. And we we wouldn't want, I, I wouldn't want to walk in and be running, I used to do terror management research or death reminder research. And I wouldn't want to walk in with my sleeves rolled up and have a bunch of tattoos that have death reminders on that because that could bias the results. So kind of thinking through what are some lab norms, and you can actually co-create this with your lab. And we'll talk a little bit more about co-creations, but I really love the idea of like using a Google Drive or OneDrive or even Teams. That way you have all of these like documented and it makes it just all housed within a single location. If it's spread through like, if you're the PI in the lab and all stuff's going to you, well, that's just a, it's a point of failure then because if the emails can be missed. Um, if a grad student's trying to do a quick IRB and needs documentation, like an IRB certificate from another member of the lab, and they're trying to email you that because you have all of them, just make it more dispersed and make it so it's easier to access the information. Now, you can also do calendar invites on there too, and like kind of track project deadlines. So I'm a huge, huge advocate of Google Drive because it's all a single location. I would not put sensitive data on there though. So please don't put like sensitive, like the ident or identifiable data on there. If you're collecting human subjects data, but like uh, that's, that'd be another thing to kind of think through. Um, so I'll, go ahead and I'll pass it over to Tiffany for a little bit to chat through that too. So there's a question in the chat about anyone know if AU is considering changing Google Workspace policy to allow students to transfer documents to faculty. This has been a real barrier to using Google Drive for me. So Eric, do you know about um, this? We, we really don't have anything to do with uh, the policies at AU, nor about anything with like Google and what's being done with Google Workspace. I, I would recommend reaching out to OIT. They'd be able to give better information because I, I don't want to give you wrong information. We, we really don't, we don't handle anything like that as ETRL. Awesome. Um, so in addition to using a like Google Drive or Teams um, or Trello, which Eric will talk to you later on, um, definitely use an external drive. I have an external drive um, and it's, really it was really helpful for me during my dissertation to have that um but definitely something that you can put a lock on um or at least put it somewhere and then <laughs> put it you know lock it and you know other people can can have access to it is really really important so um just things to kind of keep in mind when you're trying to get your getting your lab together um I'm just thinking about what else you can do. So when you're talking about scheduling, scheduling is that where we're at right now? So scheduling can use can use the calendar for scheduling. Um, definitely, as Eric had mentioned before, um, just try to make sure everybody is on the same calendar schedule. So if you're using Gmail to schedule those updates, or if you're using um, Outlook or whatever it is, try to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So something that I tend to do because I have my home schedule and then I have my work schedule is that I will send a reminder to my home schedule. And so my other person, person that um, is, or my other email address, I will actually put it into my calendar so that I know where I'm supposed to be. Um, if it's on Zoom, if it's a physical place, you know, so just make sure that everybody is like on the same page and you have all those email addresses or what have you. I think that's something that's really, really important um, when it comes to, you know, scheduling and calendar and cal calendaring and all that lovely jazz. Um, so, yeah, it's something that's really important. Um, make sure that everybody has yeah, I love what Eric just said. The calendar can be used for lab times. If if you're supposed to be in there and your lab during your lab time and just make sure everybody's supposed to be where they're supposed to be. Um, sometimes it can get really messy when people don't know where they're supposed to be. And so just 
it's really helpful to have students just put out dice out those blocks of time on their calendar. Um, and I think that's one of the things I like about Outlook is that it will say that I'm busy when I'm when I have something that I've got going on. And so anytime like Eric will look at my calendar or I look at Eric's calendar, I know that either a like he's in a consultation or he's got something going on. But at the end of the day, I know that he's busy. So that's one of the things I do. I have to admit that I do like about Outlook. Um, so anyway, on to the drive project descriptions, help new members figure out what they want to do, want to be doing. I think it's really important to sit down with your students and just kind of figure out what really is going to drive them while they're there. Um, I remember when I was a doc student, one of my, um, when one of my programs, because I went through three programs, <laughs> another story for another day. Um, but um, one of the faculty members said to me that they wanted me to be doing the work that she was doing. And I was like, mm, that's not what's waking me up in the morning. So I think it's really important to kind of sit down with students and figure out what, what really is going to drive them while they're working with you. Um, and it's just really, it's just gonna be really important to figure that out early on. You don't want somebody on your on your team that's not gonna wanna be there after day one. So just sit down and have that very frank and honest conversation. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Zotero because I love Zotero. I think Zotero is so much easier to get around than EndNote, um, but Zotero is something that we use. Um, it's definitely, yeah, shared libraries for the win. <laughs> so Zotero, um, it's really easy to share your library collection or your article collection with other people um, through Zotero. Um, it's also easy for citation. So that's really something important when you're working on a paper and you're, you know, it's like, okay, this is APA format or maybe it's Chicago or maybe it's MLA or whatever it is. Um, it's really easy to just use Zotero um, to just it's plug and chug. Um, so I, I personally really appreciate Zotero. I use Zotero during my dissertation um, and I found it extremely helpful. Um, so yeah, I couldn't talk more about Zotero. <laughs> I could probably talk a hole in the wall um, and just talk about how amazing it is. I do believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are is somebody in the library to help you with Zotero? Is that correct, Eric? Okay, so there is somebody in the library to help you with Zotero if you have questions about setting up Zotero or what have you, um, which is really, really helpful. Um, make sure you have a reading list. Um, what you, like what they should know um, at the start. What are some things that your, the people in your lab should know when they're beginning their work with you? That's something that's really important. You don't want them to kind of come in cold turkey and be like, I don't know anything. So just kind of have that, those reading materials ready for them. And, you know, before, on like either before or on day one. Um, so that they, they're just prepared. They feel more prepared um, and everybody's on the same page. I think one of the one things I really enjoyed watching um, Talisa Carter working with her and her group is that she was able to really get her group ready and be like, okay, these are all the reading materials you need. And this is what we're gonna be doing. And I just really appreciated watching her take her lab through that process. Um, so yeah, just not that I'm trying to name drop, but <laughs> But I, but it's really important to make sure that everybody's on the same page when it comes to that kind of information, um, research articles. And again, you can store those research articles on Zotero through that shared library. Again, full circle there. Um, Mind if I interject about articles for yeah, a second? Go ahead. So Zotero, 100%. I still need to get better at using Zotero. But one of the projects I work on right now is a systematic review of Bayesian methods. So what my collaborator and I do is we have a, a folder of just all of our articles and we have a spreadsheet that we put like contents, we put all the, the metadata in here. It's easier probably through Zotero, 
So this isn't the easiest thing to do or e the best method, but having this and then maybe like have, if there's separate projects, like dedicated folder for a specific project and then the articles related to that project in there too. I uh, just, because when it comes time to write all those papers, it's going to make it so much easier because you have all of that in like a nice storage bin. Um, so I'm always with the mindset, think smarter rather than making more work for yourself later on. Yeah. Um, it's it's going to save you time and energy. Uh, and related to that too, with project descriptions, I like having those in that folder too, because it's a reminder about what this project's about, because I've seen the project shift over time. And it, it's good to have that kind of, documentation so not only can folks who are new to the like yeah i'm really interested in this project or just like hey we haven't touched this project in a while what was this one about so you have those reminders too right you want to work smarter not harder so that's just that should be a theme for everybody when they're setting up their lab and working with students and anytime they're doing a research paper just working smarter not harder um Training documents, documentation, lab specific stress code norms. I mean, that's something that Eric just touched on. Um, I, I think that, I mean, we have somebody here in CTRL who used to work in the hard sciences and um, they were talking about how, um, you know, you had to have your shoes covered, your feet covered and wearing sleeves and things of that nature. So if you're one of the sci like science labs, um, maybe just reminding your students, like, this is how you should come dressed appropriately while wearing pants, not shorts. Um, in my line of work, it's, it's really, you're connecting with people. So is it, you know, do you want stuff all over your shirt? No, you know, you kind of want to make sure that you go in looking professional. Um, and so it just, it just kind of depends on what you are trying to accomplish and what you actually are doing. I think that's something for you to really consider. So just be very specific and upfront with your students and then also with yourself. You know, you want to replicate that behavior um, with them. Um, but also you want to be able to co-create that behavior with them. Like you want to talk it out. You don't want to dictate to them, be like, this is what it's going to be. Be like, okay, well, let's talk about it, you know. Um, so I think that's something that's just really, really important. Eric, were you going to go ahead and say something? Um, I was about to say the co-creation too. And I think maybe this lends itself nicely to talk about vertical versus flat labs. Mm -hmm. Should we talk for a few minutes about that? We should. Um, so for context, uh, I was involved in like seven or eight different psych labs in grad school. At any time, I just was all over the place. So I, I got to see a whole gamut of different structures. And it, it's going to be personal preference, what works for you, um, but you want to be consistent. If you're designing a lab to be a vertical structure where you're in charge and like maybe underneath you are the grad students and underneath them are undergrad RAs, that's okay. I was in part of a bunch of labs that that's the structure. I've also seen ones where it's more flat, where you have the specific projects, but everyone was able to help out with everything else. It, it depends on your comfort level and what, what makes most sense for what you're doing. Uh, I don't think there's any right or wrong way, but just be consistent. Uh, I, I've seen one where they try to switch it halfway and it, that was just a recipe for disaster because it's it, it changes the norms and the expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you want to start with the projects and um, being realistic with the timelines? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I used to be really unrealistic, like, oh, yeah, I can knock out this paper in two weeks. Or, yeah, I'll have the data analysis done in two days. Uh, be realistic. I like backwards design whenever it comes to research. So one opportunity you can do is, like, maybe that first lab meeting after introductions, after talking about the projects, be like, think about expectations. Think about what they're going to get out of the lab, whether it's a doc student, whether it's a, a, an undergrad or a master's student or a collaborator. Just think through well what's expectations and is it going to be like well getting this paper out for a special issue is it maybe there's this conference that's going to be in next year in july let's shoot for that and then work backwards of those due dates so when when do you need to have when you submit it when do you need to have the presentation done or the analyses done 
and to kind of work backwards because that, I'll give you a nice timeline of things and then give yourself a at least like a two week cushion with things. Because never nothing ever goes right for research. That's one of the joys of research. It's it's never perfect cookie cutter all the time. Definitely not. But give yourself a wiggle room, and then plan backwards to when. So I like to do like kind of what's the ideal date? What's the the date it needs to get done by? And when when's the drop dead deadline? Like the point of no return. Having those in mind, then you kind of know you get a better idea of like how long it's going to take within this, and just be realistic because you don't want to burn out. You don't want to just dedicate all your time and energy to like work. 24 hours to meet a deadline because that that's not that's not healthy that's not good spread it out and also you don't want to do that to any of anyone's working in your lab too because you don't want to that's not a that's not a good habit to be in you don't want to model that behavior either like i, I used to model, i used to just run stuff in grad school i'd, I'd be up to like 3 a.m running analyses to make a deadline but then my undergrads who are working with me would see that and think oh that's what I'm expected to do. So just model that behavior. Um, and, and just, yeah, research burnout's a thing. And just be mindful. And I'm, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent. But uh, Tiffany, your thoughts on project timelines as well? Yeah, I, I would have to echo what you just said, like being realistic. I know that this project that um, that I'm on with two other people, it has taken us two years. The first year was collecting data and the second year has been um, transcribing um, the interviews and majority, I would say about 75% of it is done. It's that last 25%. So being a qualitative researcher, it's it's very hard um, because you're emotionally taking in all of what's being said. And so trying to separate yourself from, from the participants can sometimes be very hard and can, um, I'm trying my best to not use the word trauma, but can inflict trauma. And so I am mean, just, you know, it's taken us as a group co collectively, it has taken us collectively that long to get through the data. Um, so we've just had to be realistic and it's like, okay, like if it's taking us this long, it's taking us this long, then fine, so be it. We're on our own timeline. All three of us have jobs. So, um, so yeah, so there's that. Um, I think in addition to that, it's, it's IRB. So we have seen <laughs> a lot of people who will come and meet with us. They're like, oh, well, I have IRB. You know, I'm going to try for, put my, put in my IRB application. We're just like, okay, that sounds great. You know, but they haven't done their city training. And unfortunately, you know, you need to make sure that you've done your city training, the CITI training before um, you get your IRB done. Um, that all, all that information can be found on the IRB's webpage for AU, but it's really important to get that city training done because it takes a long time to get it done. It's just, I mean, it's, clicking through modules and modules and modules. I don't even remember how many modules I, I did, um, but it's just really important to, to be very mindful of your timeline um, when you're going through all this. And then also everybody who is on your research team needs to also go through their city training as well. So just anybody who is in connection with what you're doing is going to have to go through the city and you're gonna have to put it on your IRB. So Again, being mindful of your timeline is going to be very important when, when putting everything into consideration. I think that's all I need to say about <laughs> Yeah, and just, um, I mean, one one thing that, not AU, but at other universities, I, I don't do human, personally, I don't do human subjects research anymore. I do statistical simulations now. Uh, back back when I used to do human subjects in grad school, the um, we used to have a, the PI and the grad student would send an initial IRB and then get that all set up over the summer. And then the first couple of weeks, everyone in the lab would be doing the city training if they were new to the lab. And then we would add them. And once they were added and they get approved, then we'd be able to start collecting data for that. Um, so typically that September month, 
or like that first couple of weeks was just city training modification of the IRB. That way it's all set and done. Um, that's one thing you can do. The and just, it, it takes time. It really takes time. And if, if a, an RA is working for you and they're getting like lab credit hours, I would recommend like that city training counts towards that lab time for the week. Cause that's a big, it's, it's a, it's a lift. It's, it's not a, a quick two hour thing. We're talking a couple of day thing. So just kind of being realistic of how long it's going to take. Um, one thing that really helps with organizational features for tasks and like IRB trainings or city trainings or anything else that needs to get done is I love Trello. I love this so, so much. It's free and you can collaborate. This is a Trello that I use for um, for some Beijing IRT stuff. So we have like things to do. We have in progress what's done. We can assign tasks and due dates and have like things about different conferences. This is from a, from a while ago, but it's super easy to create. It's, you can use it as a web browser or on your phone or on your desktop or Apple. It's, it's a really, really great system completely free i'm a big proponent of open source because i don't like to pay for stuff but the it's a great organizational thing and you can just go ahead and check things off and you can create checklists on it assign tasks the same features you can use in microsoft too for or if like microsoft teams to assign tasks but that way things don't slip through the cracks you're not having to run through and try to do a whole lot of stuff in a short amount of time because that's that's not a fun place to be in I think I might use use Trello now. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. I keep on forgetting my password, but it, it's good. It's a good system. So our next learning outcome is um, generating a training. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. One thing we forgot to mention about um, timelines is if you have a grad student that this is like their thesis or their dissertation or their capstone project, having that discussion early and then working backwards of when when's the dissertation due by when do they have to have the committee sign off by and work backwards so again backwards design because uh, those things we, we've all done them they're they're they take a while and so just having that conversation early on too and thinking through what's what's a realistic timeline are they going to be able to get data collected defended if everything with the entire dissertation done in a semester no i tried that i tried that really because my funding was running out so i had a short amount of time um but it's you gotta be realistic with stuff and think about well what makes the most sense to so i just wanted to interject that really quick just to no, set, yeah. you, you always want to set up set up your lab for success set up your students for success that's what you want Our second learning outcome is generating a training tool or training protocol for lab members. So you want to think about through you want to think through how lab meetings will be run. I know we when I was in grad school, our lab meetings were like every Wednesday at like 10 o'clock or every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, and they were an hour and a half, two hours long. And you know, typically an hour and a half long. Um but we would go through what each person was working on. Um, let it be, I mean, sometimes it was an update to the web page, um, or maybe it was a conference we were attending, or maybe it's an article we were all working on, um, or maybe it's instead of it's that conversation, maybe it's a conversation about an article you've all read, but making sure that you're all on the same page and setting an agenda ahead of time so that everybody who know who's going to be coming to the meeting knows what they're going to be responsible for is something that's really, really important, especially when it comes to funding. Um, I, I mean, you just don't want a grad student to be floating around, um, especially if it's a grad student. But even when you're working with an undergrad, again, undergrads are going to mimic what they see. And so it's going to be really important to just have an agenda outlined um, when meeting with any type of student at any level. Um, you Again, something that Eric and I said already is co-constructing the lab norms and expectations. So authorship on papers and conference presentations for students have that discussion early on. Um, so I remember, and, and then Eric, I'm gonna send it back to you. I remember early on one of my very first conversations about um, 
authorship was I knew that I was going to be last author, which was fine because I was a new, I was new, I was a doc student, but I also go by my full name professionally. And so <laughs> the first author messed up and just put Tiffany Quash. And I'm like, nope. So I had to go back and, it was, you know, we, we made, even though it may not seem like a big deal um, to some of us, it's a big deal for me. It's a big deal. Um, but I, we had that conversation early on. We also had the conversation early on about where I was in the line of um, authorship. And then it was that conversation of like when we had the next publication coming out, rotating authors. Um, so that's what I do with the other two people that I publish with. We rotate with each other. So like I was first author on one paper, then I became third author on the next paper. And then the next paper, I'm like second author. And it's really not a big deal because all three of our names are appearing. Um, and somebody's first author at one point in time. So that's something that's really, really important to take note of. I'm sending it back to you, Eric. Yeah. So, um, yeah, authorship, have those discussions early, early on at like, the start of the project, to be honest. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of a cough. So, um, like in grad school, I, I was on a project that got pulled in for the, rerunning all the statistical analyses. And I was going to be like the third or fourth author on this. So I'm like, okay, whatever. It's going to be a low lift for me. I'll just run a bunch of analyses. I ended up spending six months, several hours each day running analyses and just doing this really iterative process. And I remember talking with the the second author of this at the time who was getting ready for to leave on internship for psychology for um for counseling psych. And they were like, uh, no, you should be a second author. Even though they're the ones who had the initial idea for the project, collected the data, like, you've done so much more than I have. You need to be a different author level. So, but they didn't feel comfortable having the conversation with the PI. So I had to have that conversation as a first year grad student. Um, fun, fun. But after some conversations, um, it, it all worked out. But it's it's an uncomfortable situation. Um because it also like how those check-ins as the project evolves, checking like does this author sequence still make sense? Has that shifted? And just being being okay with the yeah, if it shifts because of bandwidth or other things, that's okay. Um, I, it's currently like whenever I'm working with my colleague, now we we're both co-first authors. We put that as a disclaimer, and that's becoming really common in my discipline. Um, I also like the idea of best out of five for super smash brothers just something like that and that's how we determine authorship because we're both like well we both worked equally it doesn't really matter um it, it's all it all depends on like the co like my colleague i've been working with her for like four years now so we're like it doesn't matter really for authorship for us um but if it's someone new it's just having that conversation and then giving them the agency to have that discussion being like hey i'm putting a lot more work in this than i thought can we can we have that conversation? Um, so that's something to really kind of think through. Um, I also want to kind of circle back to how lab meetings are done too. So the I've seen a bunch of different styles for this. If you want to have it be like each week you read an article, I've seen those are okay. Keep it short though, especially if you're tasking all your students to do a lot of stuff in lab. Keep it short because um, having them expecting them to read a fifty page article for the next week on top of what they're doing it's a lot um but it's okay if it's, if it's a seminal article or a really cool technique awesome um i was in a bunch of labs that did that i was in labs that we did around the tables and talk about project updates and that's great too and talking through issues but i always really like skill development so i think if if you're working in a lab or having someone in your lab work for you making sure they're developing skills so I, I like to dedicate time for like maybe it's a half of a lab one day where we're just like hey this is how I data clean like hey this is how I go about this process and then giving them those skills because that's they're working with you to learn and so I want to make sure they walk out and they feel comfortable doing stuff um but yeah that's kind of my thoughts on like authorship and how to run meetings um let me pass back to you Tiffany I want me to sure. hit the next point. Um, I think I kind of started hitting on the next point. 
Um, so the skills and trainings and our uh, skills and trainings discussions. So I think it's really important to talk to people who um, talk to each other about what their skills are and then also what their skills are not. Um, and that's, like, like you said earlier, it can be a very intimidating conversation to have, especially for this, specifically for the student, maybe not for us, but for the student to say, hey, you know what, I don't have the skill set. Um, and that's okay, because that's what we're here for. Um, and that's what you're there for, is to help them bridge the gap in their knowledge. And you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with saying, with educating your student. And, and, and if you don't know the answer, that's fine. Um, but you also have resources that are around you. You have the library, you have us, you have, you know, there, you have resources that are around you. So please don't, you know, don't hesitate to reach out and say, hey, I need help with X, Y, and Z um, in a timely fashion, please. <laughs> um, but definitely have those skills and training discussions. Um, I know that, do we want to talk about the spring? Yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, we can talk about it. Okay. So in the spring, um, if people are interested in having um, there being trainings for your labs, we are available to do that in the spring. Note that I'm saying in the spring, not the fall, but the spring. Um, and and we'll, we're here, we are here to support you in that way. Definitely you have to give us enough time ahead of time so that we can plan and then as much detailed information about what it is your needs are. Um, so for instance, and again, I'm gonna drop Lisa Carter's name. I did a um, training for her um, and her team talking about in vivo and coding. And that was um, for two and a half hours, I believe. Um, two and a half, three, three, maybe three hours of in vivo training. So with her lab. Um, so that was really helpful for them. It was fun for me. Um, Eric, you did a training recently as well. Yep, I did a um, a day and a half training. It was a full day and a half training too, of how to use R for psychological research. Um, that's everything from how to install and the basics of R to really advanced analysis like multi level modeling for longitudinal data. Um, so uh, we're happy to do those. It just uh, if we're using data, it takes a while to prep all of that though for material, especially if it's like really specific topics and not like really basic intro stuff. Um, I personally use R, so I am has I, I, I do know some Stata. We do not have SAS at AU. I do want to mention that really quickly. We do not have a campus license anymore. But if it's for another program, can definitely do that. Um, I prefer R just for open source because I'm open source. That's my, that's my whole thing. Um, open coding, open data for life, yeah. Um, but happy to do those things. We just need advanced notes because it, it takes a while to to write everything up and have everything. So it's not a quick turnaround. Um, and I'm happy. I'm happy to share like why we're saying this in the spring um, because I, we don't want to, especially for quantitative. I'm going to be on parental leave um, starting in mid October, so I'm. I don't want to. May I don't want to have stuff planned. Like in in plan and then me having to say like hey i can't do this anywhere i'm i'm on parental leave i can't help you now uh so it's kind of i don't want to put that onto anyone's for their research labs that's why we're saying in the spring for that um because I'm, I'm not going to be able to do anything once baby's born so my apologies i just want to be full transparency within that um, but we're happy to do that if it's like if if you're working with like structural equation modeling or like latent variable modeling or multi-level stuff i love that stuff um my train i focus more on psychometrics so i love that stuff and then it's just that's why we're here we're here to help you out and if it's um the i won't i'm not going to mention too much but like the folks i was working on the psych department they used spss but they wanted to use r none of them really had experience with the r and so it was me kind of walking them through how how can you take what you have currently move that over to r so if you have examples of another software analyses you run, you're like, well, I know how to do this in this program. How can I do it with this other program? 
if you can send us with examples, de-identified data, we can incorporate that into, into the trainings and we're happy to do that. Um, again, it's just, we want to have an idea of how, what's the bandwidth, what's, what's the time frame you're looking at and like how long you want the trainings. Cause if it's, it could be a three hour session, it could be a two day session. It could be maybe a, a series of two hours over a couple of weeks too. We're, we can do that, but we just, we want to plan accordingly. We want to make right. sure that what we provide you is high quality and, and not a rush job. Because no one wants that, right? No. <laughs> um, so we already talked about who is on the project and who leads and what is the lab structure of, what is the structure of the lab? We've already talked about that. We've already talked about the vertical versus flat. Um, we've also talked about city trainings. Mm -hmm. um, Consider small meetings if there's a project lead. I mean, we've already briefly talked about that. Like definitely um, sometimes, you know, as, as faculty or as people who are in leadership roles, we need to also relinquish, I am say relinquish our power to let, let the students lead, um, let them lead the meetings. Um, again, you want to make sure that you're creating this, co-creating this environment where they feel that they have a sense of leadership and ownership and in in the research. So that's something that's really important to kind of take note of. Um, yeah, so that's our second learning outcome. Our third learning outcome is described. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the, the small groups. Um, this is also really beneficial if your lab is doing a whole lot of projects, because if you're doing like four or five projects, you're going to run out of time in a one hour lab meeting or a two hour lab meeting. You're not going to be able to make really headway on anything. It's all going to be superficial. So if you have doc students lead each project or have separate project meetings for each one that are smaller <laughs> rather than the full one, like the full lab meetings bring back to everyone. So like they understand what's going on, but really I like the small doc meet or the small meetings run by doc students for each project. Cause then they take ownership. That's building agency. And helping them develop the skills to lead a lab. Um, so, it, I mean, that's what I was in, in undergrad. And that's really set the standard for me. Because I was like, that worked. We were really, really, we got a lot of projects done with the three of us. So it was awesome. Um, but it's also like, I still talk to the grad student who is now a, a director of a of a research lab over at uh, Columbia Medical. And it's like, this is like over, th almost like 14 years ago. And I still chat with them all the time. And it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. You wanna go to the third learning outcome now? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead. Sorry, I wanted to mention that really quick. Uh, so third outcome, uh, describe options to aid onboarding, communicate with lab members. Um, so we talked a little bit about this about Trello. Um, thing is, like my framework on this is be transparent. Um, I was in a lab where we we started a couple of weeks before the semester started, but it was like a five page email to everyone who had been to the lab, and that's intimidating. So, if you can consider like a quick blurb, like "Hey, really excited about." um doing like doing an introduction lab meeting is your first one just for lab or orientation um just kind of talk through stuff so dedicate that first time don't don't think you can get to your research projects at that first one but rather mm -hmm. think of it as like orienting everyone getting on the same page and have an agenda have a plan and have some fun activities in there too um, because it can get really overwhelming really quickly if it's just going through page by page of like a 10 page lab protocol, break things up. Um, and that, that's kind of my thoughts. I've seen it done really well. And I've also seen like the first day in the lab, oh, here, start running participants and you have no idea what's going on. You, you want to avoid that latter one. Yeah, I I was in a lab where there was five of us and 
I always felt like you were just kind of running in circles because things weren't always thought out. So you definitely want to make sure that everything is organized. Um, we already talked about task and due dates and then using Teams over Google Drive. Did you want to address that? Um, the one thing I just mentioned within like Teams, Google Drive, anything like that, make it easier for yourself, but also have backups of everything too. Like get that external drive and save copies of stuff just in case. Um, th technology happens, weird things happen, things get lost. So always just make sure you have backups of stuff because it it's horrible if you have to redo everything from scratch. So we're going to talk about the last thing. The last thing we'll talk about is funding. And I know funding is a sticky topic, um, but if going for funding, consider having lines for, for paid research assistance um, and money for conference registration and RAs that are presenting. You want to definitely make sure that they get something out of it, um, out of being a part of your lab. I mean, Yes, it's always great when you can pay for a meal for your RA or something, which is wonderful. Um, but definitely give them that line that they can put on their resume or their CV where they've presented at a, at a conference. Um, if you're able to pay your RA, that is even better. Because um, we have heard horror stories where there was an unpaid RA and, you know, it's just, that did, it just didn't sound good. It didn't, yeah, it didn't sound good. But we just, you know, if you're able to do that, that's great. Um, but if you're able to even pay for their conference registration or something, that's even better. So just kind of thinking about those type of things um, in the future. Because it actually shows that you care about them and their growth. You're invested. So. So having said that, Eric, did you want to add anything? Um, just a couple of quick things too within this, because I, I didn't really get the experience of working on grants too much. I had to teach myself and take a course on it because um, it just, the person I was working with, they just wrote everything up themselves and I never really got to see it or see the intricacies of it. And consider that maybe it's a skill development for either your grad students or your undergrads. If they're interested, show them the process, show them what it takes to write a grant, get their feedback on it. Um, Cause that's, those are all really great skills to have on their CV or their resume. Like if I, if I was learning how to write like a data analysis plan or even like a proposal for a grant, just like how to actually write that and have it be coherent yeah, on my CV. I, I just imagine when I was applying to graduate student or grad schools, that skill, have walking into that as like a first year doc student, or even as a faculty member, seeing that and having experience with that, that's all fantastic skills to have. So it's, I always like to think of like, what things am I doing that I can I, if someone's interested, I can teach someone else. I can have them walk through with me mm -hmm. um, rather than doing it in isolation. Because, I mean, research isn't really, it's not meant to be like this isolation piece. So if there's things that you can share, and I'm always a big fan of like pay it forward. I learned some really cool techniques because someone took the time to teach me something I couldn't learn in a class. And whenever there's an instance I can do that for someone else, like that, that's why I do what I do. Agree. So having said all of that, um, does anybody have any questions for us? Or where are you in your journey in setting your lab up for the fall? Um, I do have some questions. But first of all, uh, thank you, Eric and Tiffany, for sharing all these information. These are uh, very helpful to me. Um, uh, very quickly, I, I'm Chen. I'm a new faculty member at COGOD. Um, I'm very young at AU. I'm only um, two and a half weeks old. 
Uh, so still trying to figure out things. Uh, one specific question is for Eric. Um, you mentioned that uh, in your research, you're, uh, you've been doing a lot of you know simulations and stuff. So I imagine, and I saw you having all those Bayesian uh, SEM and RLT papers. So uh, I can relate to what you do. Um, a lot of code writing, a lot of uh, waiting for the computer to finish running something. Um, so my question for you is, uh, is there any resources on campus for, um, so I'm specifically talking about computational resources. I was um, looking at setting up my lab in terms of buying hardware, like getting a fast computer and stuff like that. But I think, um, first of all, it's not really that sustainable. Um, you know, hardware, they sort of become outdated very soon. Um, and I, so I was thinking whether there is any resources that I can use at the university level. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, and happy to chat more about some computation stuff. I, I oh, love yeah. chat, talking about stats and coding. Um, I, I mean, I also use a lot of GitHub. I didn't mention that in here because I feel that's kind of more uh, more specific, but GitHub, oh, it's it's been a lifesaver. Uh -huh. uh, but for institutional stuff, um, what I'd recommend is the high performance computer at AU. Mm -hmm. So as a faculty member, also any any students who are working with you, they can request a an account on the high performance computer. It is it's um it is at the end of life, but there is going to be a a replacement unit in the next yeah. one or two years. Uh, it's we're looking at potentially increased uh, GPU, some additional CPU. It's not going to it's not going to be a huge HPC, uh -huh. but it's going to be comparable to what we have currently. Um, gotcha. The nice thing is we have software on there with MATLAB, we have a, um, R, Python, a bunch of other uh, specialized mm -hmm. software on there too. And so, I mean, that's a really good way, so like, especially if you're doing really heavy computational stuff, you don't want it to be essentially mm -hmm. maxing out your computer. So yeah. sending over to that, I mean, you can do batch submissions and have it run in the background, which is fantastic. Gotcha. Um, there's other things like AWS, you can do cloud computing. We don't have that as a university though mm -hmm. um it, it can get really expensive really quickly yeah. um so i mean th there's i would try the high performance computer first and see it does that meet your needs um i mean you could do some dedicated hardware i'm thinking like um a thread ripper or something like that they can do like uh -huh. know, like a, for like startups but those get really costly too and then yeah, yeah. It's so thinking expensive. like yeah, and then like in two or three years, you're possibly looking at a, a replacement upgrade. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, again, like you mentioned, it's scalable. Is that is that efficient? Um, but yeah, I, I would try the high performance computer and happy to answer any questions you have on it. Actually, I'm the liaison for the HPC. So like I work oh, with awesome. the, the committee. Mm -hmm. And so like if you for, like once you get your account made, I, I usually give all the training. So we do like a one-on-one -on -one training virtually and uh -huh. I walk you through like how to connect how to send oh, nice, jobs. Nice, nice. So yeah, happy to walk through all of that fun stuff. Oh, cool. That That's that's so good to know. Um, and Eric, please expect that uh, I will be bribing you for the coming semester. Oh, uh, but you're, you'll be on, on, on parental leave. So, but anyways. I'll, I'll be here for a while beforehand. So okay. happy to chat beforehand and just, yeah, let yeah, me know. Yeah. Have, and yeah, we can chat more about it and get you up and running. Yeah, that's awesome. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, this is very important. This is very helpful. Cool. Mm -hmm. And welcome to AU. <laughs> yeah, welcome to AU. Ah, thank you. Um, it's it's in the summer, so uh, I'm still, I, I didn't really had a chance to mingle with people, but I try to attend all these sessions as much as possible. So uh, it's it's been fun. AU has a lot of resources, so uh, I'm very happy. At least uh, I'm very happy since uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, cool. Also, let me go ahead and um, I'm going to drop my email in the chat for now. That way, just in case for any follow-ups or anything like that, happy to happy to chat more. Um, and actually, let me go ahead and put the um, uh, Tiffany, you have the consultation link handy, or I can pull it up really quick. I, I can get, get it. it. I got it. Um, so Tiffany, I also have um, consultations available too. They are the first come first serve. Um, but oh, perfect. Uh, is this the oh, cool? No, that's the okay. 
Um, so if you want to talk like talk through like quant or computational consultation or qualitative or survey, um, if it's mixed methods, we don't have a mixed methodologist, but Tiffany and I try to tag team those as best we can. Um, but always happy to chat through specifics of research at any point in the research project and kind of talk through things. So that's uh, something that we provide for for all of AU. Uh, it's got to be specific for faculty research, though. We can't do anything with like courses or like coursework. But, we yeah, strongly encourage if there's a student that's working with you, like if you could work, if you could come with the student, so nothing is lost in translation, that would be great. It's really, really helpful um, if the student is, if you're able to come with the student. But yeah, please don't send your classes to us. <laughs> There is a, uh, for classes, there is actually, um, if you go to AU, AUS, or AU um, I, always mis I always get the acronym confused, ASAC. There's a, I think it's through the math stat department. So they actually have dedicated, um, dedicated um, grad students to help support for classwork. And like, if there's issues with like R, STATA, or all those fun things. So they have that adaption too. We used we used to do that at CTO, but now we're we're faculty focused instead. But I know we, we threw a whole lot out. Yeah, and I, I know that's um different disciplines might be different things you might want to consider within your labs. But let us know if you have any questions or like follow up with us as well. We're always happy to chat through and we're just we're here to help you out with your research. Yeah. Just thank you all. Bye, everybody. Take care.